Hello, this is Stephen and Jennifer Mitchell with Iowa Backyard Farmer, and we want to talk with you today about 10 principles that we use to successfully start vegetable seeds. And this is true. This is true. And it's principles because these aren't tips and tricks. These are really things that you need to master if you're going to have success in growing seeds. Yeah. So one of the nice things, though. And they're not new. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> None of these are new. Um, but uh, I'm always reminded that plants are very... Um, Oh, what's the word I'm looking for? They plants want to grow, and so yeah, it's a great hobby because they're trying to help you out. They their their life is at stake. They're giving it their all. Yeah, they, they're they're doing all that they can do, and these these principles are really just to help help take the plant from beyond just surviving to thriving. Mm -hmm. So, so let's start by talking about seeds. So, what do you look for in getting good seeds? Because believe it or not, this is an important step. Yeah. So yeah, first principle is is your. You can't uh, outperform your genetics. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the, uh, the 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 max yield potential, the the max production potential, the max taste, all that stuff really begins with the genetics. And if you don't start with really good tasting genetics, you're not going to get a really good flavor. If you don't start with really high yielding genetics, you're not going to get really high yield, no matter what else you do. So That's right. I'm, so choosing I'm the five seeds, three. The NBA was never in my future. I <laughs> I could do a lot of things, but I'm not ever going to be that level. <laughs> yeah. Yep. And and so we got to start with something good, and then everything else supports helping those those seeds reach their genetic potential. And so. So the question always is: So where do you buy your seeds? And you have a shocker oh. <laughs> experience for us. <laughs> so. I, I, my day job is with a seed company, and I do remember visiting with a, a customer once, and he made the comment that the most expensive seeds he was ever he ever planted were free seeds given to him by a cheaper seed company. And when your life is dependent on having high yields, and you plant something that has much lower yield potential, it doesn't matter what the cost of the seeds are. It, it really, it really ended up back. And as you him. as you scale up, that expense became becomes yeah, really significantly big. more. And the, <laughs> the numbers he shared with us over a thousand acres, it was about a um, I'm trying to remember, it was like a twenty five thousand dollar difference um, because he used the free seeds and, and lost so, twenty five thousand dollars. So choos <laughs> choosing uh, really good varieties is is probably the most critical part of what we do. So your suggestion would not to be. This is my favorite retailer. Yeah, so a lot of people ask, well, which store should I go buy my seeds at? And I, I just as a reminder, all of the retail businesses, the places that we buy online, really that's what they are. They are a, they, a seed seller, a seed, seed retailer. Re reseller, a yeah. retailer. Uh, most of them don't grow their own seeds. Uh, now there are some that do, but for the most part, they are buying seeds from a wholesaler, probably the same wholesaler that grew that exact same variety for, for another for, seed company. For 20 other seed companies. <laughs> yep. And so uh, if I, my first recommendation is just to choose the right variety. And then find a place to buy it And then find a from. place to buy it from that has good service, has maybe the free shipping, has other perks. Um, that being said, seed companies do specialize. So different companies. So I'm really into chili peppers this year. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to find better chili pepper selections somewhere in New Mexico. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> so I'm looking at the Sandia Seed Company for all my chilies because... Everywhere else you look for an Anaheim pepper and, and almost everywhere else they just say generic Anaheim. We've bought from Johnny's. They have three different Anaheims. We go to Sandia Seed Company and they have about a dozen different Anaheims with different... Or different green chilies, yeah. Yeah, different, different green chilies um, for different heats different speeds, you know, for those that are targeted towards being green when they are consumed versus those targeted towards being red when they're consumed. So going someplace where they are going to specialize and get you the good genetics can be really, really valuable. But do your research before you do loyalty to some sale or something. And, you know, I, I get seed catalogs from 20 different places every year and they're so pretty and the pictures are so pretty. Just do the research, find out what you want. And, and then find a supplier, yeah. and then find a supplier. Now, now there are some some um, retailers that also carry ex exclusive. So if you want a particular variety, there may be only one place to get it. Yeah, so Burpee does this a lot. You have ex Burpee exclusive, and some of those are really good, and, mm -hmm. and we get them. Yeah, yeah, and we get those um, as well. Um, 
what if I've got seed from last year or two years or from a seed swap or 10 years ago? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I know a lot of professional growers, they buy new seed every year. We buy a lot of new seed every year, but we carry over a lot of our seed. And why, you know, why can we do that? Well, two things. You can, you can germ test your own seeds and make sure that they're still viable. And two, we save a lot of money because we can buy in bulk and and get that but we know which seeds are likely to stay good so i'm not buying onion seeds ahead they go bad i'm not buying lots of parsley seeds ahead they're going to go bad but peppers tomatoes eggplant i'm usually good for yeah. a couple of years <clears throat> and we're a small enough operation that a miss here or there um i can mostly recover mm -hmm. from mostly yeah. but fresh <laughs> seeds is important <laughs> yep so so we have principle one is get good seeds Get good seeds. So principle two is use the right growing materials. So we started out, I think, using yogurt cups and digging dirt from our backyard garden. <laughs> yeah, is, 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 sad. Isn't that good enough? What, what do you mean by right growing materials? Okay. So <laughs> there is a lot of information out of that out there and most of it is conflicting. So we're not even going to address any of that, but let's just stick with the principle. And we'll talk about lighting and watering in a minute. But to start seeds, you don't need a lot of soil. You don't need, you don't need any soil. You can use a soilless <laughs> mixture. But keep it in a shallow tray. So if I'm planting, and I'm going to use your cup for an example, and I have my lights up here, and I've planted Sorry. stuff in a, in a shallow tray, in a shallow tray and then a cup, and then I have to hang my lights way up here, which is going to be too high for half of my seedlings. And so you want to plant it so you can get equal light. Um, beyond that, um, you need materials that aren't going to mold. We went through a phase where, you know, everybody <laughs> wants to do something cool. And so we did peat pots and toilet paper tubes and, and yeah. Dixie cups mm -hmm. and newspapers. Newspaper. And and, yeah. um, We've tried them all. <laughs> we've tried them all. We've tried them all. And a lot of those mold. If it stayed wet enough to, to grow plants, then the sides got all moldy. And I mean, you're like, it's a benefit. It's going to decompose. Well, it doesn't help if it decomposes before I'm done with it, right? Yeah. <laughs> My mom doesn't have that problem where she's in a much drier place. And so she can get away with some of that. But then she puts it in the ground to plant it. And some of those decomposable pots didn't decompose because yeah. it's too dry, right? So it can go both ways. So you want to make sure we have, I bring, I'll show you this one. This is one that you made for me. Yeah, this was one of our, our, our first year where we decided we were going to try to start growing stuff in bulk. Yeah. I, I built these and, um, and just this, out of cedar planks, basically. Yeah, and leftover <clears throat> stuff. And this was really great because you could fill this up and it was nice and shallow. We put it under the lights. This was really hard to overwater. It has really good drainage. We put this on a cookie sheet and, and this had advantages to it. The disadvantage is one of our other steps to write materials is that this one's really hard to clean. So it's, it's hard to clean, and eventually when we would plant, you know, 100 seeds in there, disassembling, trying to, to disconnect the roots and stuff made it uh, uh, not as efficient use of our time when we got to the point where we were growing thousands instead yeah. of just hundreds. So if you're, if you're just growing your own backyard and you just have 20 little things you want to grow or 15, you can use little individual containers or a small thing um, as you scale up that becomes increasingly difficult and it, it was not worth our time. And so we've switched to more professional seed trays. Yeah. So early on, we used to be able to just go dig a little bit of dirt out of our beautiful Iowa soil, but we don't do that anymore. Why is that? Well, there's, there's, this, there's this thing, it's called the disease triangle. <laughs> and so in order for you to have disease, you need to have a susceptible host, your mm -hmm. poor little seedling, a pathogen present, your dirt, which even though I know you grow it organic and you fertilize it and you manure it and it's perfect, it's still going to have bacteria and fungus in it. And you bring that inside and now it's subject to inside weather conditions. We create the perfect environment. And you create the perfect <laughs> environment and, and it's not going to be ideal for your seedlings. It's going to be too heavy. You're going to get fungal problems like damping off. You're going to have poor emergence. I mean, sometimes people have said, well, you could do that and then mix it with some perlite. 
Uh, and I've heard of people that just say, well, just bring in your soil and microwave it for a few minutes. Yeah, and I've heard that. You, too. you can do that. You can sterilize <laughs> it and get rid of it. Um, I've heard that's stinky. Yeah. So <laughs> we have found that it's much easier. And we're doing tests right now on soilless start, seed starting mixes. And so watch that video later. It's coming out. It's really interesting. But... Um, and, and but, but we've we've tried some of the other ones that are have been not so successful. So we we've gone yeah. with a super cheap seed starting mix and 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 pot, potting up mix and um, sometimes it's okay. Sometimes it's kind of a nightmare. Yeah. Sometimes we had one year where we had bought just the potting mix, and it had worked for us for several years. But they changed the recipe or something, and all of my seedlings came up yellow. They were totally without nitrogen. And I don't know what they changed. I wasn't in charge. <laughs> it, yeah. it didn't work. I had to repot them all and we lost some. Yeah. So and we lost some. So it's, So basically you're, it needs to be light. It needs to be loose enough to go and you want a kind of finer texture. We're doing, you know, potting mixes like miracle Grow. They have more bark and bigger chunks. Your seeds are going to have a harder time working around that. You're going to have a harder time working with it. Yeah. So. so good drainage, not compacting, and disease-free. And in that category, if you can find something that does all those things, we're not brand specific. Yeah. It'll work. So we've tried several different things. So And keep your pots clean. Good sanitation. We're going to clean it up every single time, every year. We've got these little pots. Um, these work really good. Um, this is one from last year. And it hasn't been cleaned out yet. And you might look at that and say, well, that looks pretty clean. I can't see any dirt from here. But we're going to wash it. Yeah, we're going to wash them good, though. And use like a bleach solution, 10% diluted if you were really being careful. Yeah. Or steam. Uh, the, or the, steam. The, 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 big, the big guys use steam and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, those we're, are fun to use. We're not that big. Not that big. So, <clears throat> so anyway, so yeah, moving on, the next principle is water your, or I guess plant. We'll get to water in a minute. Plant your seeds correctly. Now, we went to school at the University of Nebraska in Lincoln. And I remember on the state capitol, there was a big statue called the Sower. And the sower is just out there just kind of throwing out the seeds all over the place. Isn't isn't that good enough? I mean, seeds are sort of cheap -ish, Sort of. Aren't they? <laughs> I don't know. Are they? I don't know. Good, good, good um, question. Our most expensive seeds this year um, are a dollar a piece. Yeah. And so so I, I like back to principle one. <laughs> if you have really good seeds, let's not throw them away by overcrowding them in a pot or just cast them out to yeah. see something might work and something might not work. Uh, we have two big problems with planting your seeds correctly. And one is the overcrowding. Mm -hmm. um, and one and two is that we're going to plant them too deep. And so I see a lot of people and they're going to plant in one of these little cups. And then you're, you've got your seed packets and everything. And you've got your soil filled up. And then you realize your lights are only this big. And so you're like, well, I will just plant a few more in there. <laughs> Ten. 20 just to be sure <laughs> you know and um hopefully those are not the dollar a piece seeds, hopefully so. <laughs> those are not the dollar a piece seeds because what happens is that they're crowded and so they're going to stretch more they're going to stretch and they're going to they're going to get tall and they're not going to grow as big maybe i'll put a picture in here um even i sometimes double plant on like our hot peppers to make sure because they have terrible germination rates to make sure i get one but if i get two that come up they're smaller. Yeah. If you get 10 that come up, they're, they're competing for resources. Yeah. Um, so they're going to, and that airflow restricted can lead to disease. And so you'll ultimately, some of them will live, some of them will probably damp off and die, and you've wasted a lot of money. And then too deep is the other problem. <laughs> so if you were going to just do an average principle for seeds, maybe one to two times the seed's diameter would be yeah. a good planting depth. And that's not end to end, like the long yeah. way, <laughs> go around the middle. Um, but when you're planting inside, too deep is more often the issue than, than not. And some of them like our spearmints or peppermints or thyme, they're really fine seeds. They need light to germinate. I sprinkle them on top and I don't put anything else on top of them mm -hmm. and they're fine. So too deep and they're, they might not germinate too shallow, then what happens? Well, it's going to dry out on you. It's going to dry out and they're going to die. They're going to start to germinate and then they're going to be like, whoop, we popped out of the soil upside down <laughs> and we dried out and, and we're done, right? 
And that's easier to fix because you can kind of poke them back in if you're checking every day. Yeah. So, so, so what other principles do we have? So I know when we, we plant, so a lot of times we plant in the 72 cell packs, but not all the time do we have 72 that we want 72 of the same thing. So how do you determine when you can plant stuff together or not? Oh, this is a really good question too. Back to if I was a smaller group that I used to have and um, I just had one light and I had one little tray, you have to figure hot, cold, and wet and dry and plant things that go together together. So for instance, we plant rosemary and thyme and lavender in the spring. None of those, oregano, none of those like to stay wet. If you put those together in something with a pot like a tomato that needs a little bit more moisture. Yeah, it's too much. It's too much for it. And you're thinking, well, I'm going to save time and bottom water the whole tray because that's really efficient. But we've underwatered <laughs> something that grows really fast like a tomato and needs more water and overwatered something like thyme that's still trying to get its roots on. Yeah, so really trying to group stuff together. I think in the past we've done stuff or in our early years of, well, let's put our hot peppers in the same tray as kale and they totally fried oh, yeah. the that, kale. This is, this is a problem. <laughs> so temperature, we'll cover temperature uh -huh. too, but not all seeds germinate at the same temperature. We'll get to that. We'll yeah. get them. And then the humidity domes. The humidity domes. Are we going to cover that one next? Oh, we got humidity coming up. So we'll cover that one in a minute. Yep. So that was principle um, three, plant correctly. So number four is water correctly. Now, I grew up in the desert of, of the far west, and water was usually the limiting factor. And so it kind of didn't matter how much we watered. It usually wasn't enough. And so I remember um, watering our garden. I mean, we would literally let the sprinkler run all night long. We'd move yeah. it to the other end of the garden and we let it run all day and then we'd move it back and let it run all night and and we had well water or in some cases yeah, so it was free water we had well water one, one house we had water that came out of the irrigation canal in another place it was essentially free but it seemed like we could never water enough so you're saying that's not how we're supposed that's to do not it. How you're supposed to do it and i have been to that spot and it's like sand and it has no water retention properties at all. The water just goes right through. So you have to keep constantly applying it. Um, peat moss does not have that same effect. Coir does not have that same effect. If you're using one of your seed starting mixes or potting soil or dirt from your garden and you're anywhere that's not your hometown, <laughs> <laughs> um, you're going to have to, you're going to have to monitor that because you don't want fungus gnats. You don't want root rot. You don't want damping off. You don't want all these things. So of the two, I mean, overwatering and underwatering are both the problems. You're going to so, have to find that gotta, Goldilocks gotta say, zone. We call it the Goldilocks zone. Not too hot, not, not too, cold, too cold, not too wet, not too dry. So what that looks like for starting your seeds is that, and I'll show you when we do our, our next video, is that all your soil mediums that I could find all start the same way. And this is the way we did it in greenhouses too, is you take that mix and you pre-moisten it before you do anything else with it. And you want it to be moist enough that you could squeeze it together in your hand and it will hold its shape, but it's not going to drip out water. It's not going to, because you, you like picture a, a dish rag and you're going to wring it out. It's damp, but it's not dripping, but, not dripping, but yeah. not dripping. And if you do that and you plant your seeds and you put on one of those humidity domes or plastic wrap or something to keep it from evaporating, most of the time you can get away with not watering again until after your seeds come up. Then after your seeds come up, you're going to use something like this. Ugh. Move that in. I don't know if that's in. It's a, a pump sprayer or a, a, a lot of times hand we just water use bottle. The little hand water bottle. This, this is easier for a lot though. Yeah, and we're doing a bunch. <laughs> and you're going to kind of mist the tops of those seeds as they're still trying to germinate and come up. At a certain point, you're going to get to where um, that's not going to reach the bottom of the tray where the roots are really effectively, and then you can start bottom watering. But I wouldn't start bottom watering with seeds that haven't sprouted. There's nothing to absorb that moisture. You'll just have soggy, yeah. soggy soil. Yep, and that's when you get into rot problems and, and fungal fungus issues. gnats. And yeah. So related to that, the next principle, number five, is control the humidity. So describe the humidity thing. I mean, we live in Iowa. It's 
people further east would say that it's it's dry. I'm from the west. I feel <laughs> it's, like it's, it's, it's very soggy. humid here. So. And, and we're in we're in my house. I'm not even in a greenhouse. So average, our house stays around 50% humidity, which leaves you some space in the air to absorb more moisture. Mm -hmm. If you have all your seedlings in a in a tray with that humidity dome on top, and the soil is saturated, there's nowhere for that water to go. It can't evaporate out. And so you need to be able to have a way for the water to evaporate out. So at our house, we're going to take those humidity domes off once it's germinated. We're going to run some fans. Do you want to talk about fans? Well, just fans in general have been a, a real game changer for us. Uh, our early years, we didn't have fans and 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 we, we had the mold issues. We had the humidity issues. We had plants that would, would lodge really easily. You take them outside. Having like, been they're inside, beautiful. They fell over. And, you know, <laughs> take them outside where it's always windy. So by adding fans and... and uh, it's just made a, a huge difference. I know some people say, oh, you can just go rub the top of the plants or whatever every once in a while, and that's sufficient. And I think anything helps. Um, but I, in our experience, having fans that run typically whenever the lights are on makes for a much stronger plant uh, for when it's time to transplant them. And out. not just that the plant is strong, but that it's absorption of water and that control of humidity. We're going to dry that soil out and like rewater dry it out. We don't want to back to the watering, you don't want to just sit it in water and forget about it for a week. You will end up with problems. Yeah. <laughs> Seedlings are like little newborn infants. They need your attention every day, sometimes a couple times a day. Um, so you're saying just don't infants, leave them in a puddle. <laughs> they will drown. <laughs> little infants need, need, need uh, yeah. a drink more than once a day. But not too much. But not I mean, too much. You don't want to drown your little kid either. What so. <laughs> if I fed you all the meals that you wanted, for a week in one sitting, how would you feel? A little bloated. I a little think. bloated, yeah. so do your plants. <laughs> and followed by a long stretch of a little hungry. Yeah, followed by really hungry. And so what happens, you'll do that and you're like over water and then you get into the cycle where it was too wet, so I let it dry out. And then you water again because it was so dry that you ended up with problems again. Okay. So, okay, so that was principle five, control the humidity. Number six is give them enough light. Now, Everybody has a window. Isn't that enough? I mean, that, that's kind of how we started. <laughs> we, yeah, it was, it was sad. We had this little tray of plants and we had a west facing window and a north facing or a it's kind of a, west a, a, and east. A, 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 yeah, west ish and east ish facing window. And so we would like push it right up to the window in the morning and then we'd run it to the back of the house in the evening. Um, and they were still very sad. They were still very we, sad. We couldn't do enough running. <laughs> Especially in the winter when there's only like nine hours of sunlight, when the reality is, is plants <laughs> that are intended for the summer, they kind of need like 16 hours. So yeah, tomatoes. even the best windows is not enough. <laughs> <laughs> Talk to us about our lighting system. There's a lot of things out there. We're still working on this. Um, you can see our light display behind us. Tell us about that a little yeah, bit. Yeah, so just in general, plants need light. And, and it's, it's, it is vital to their growth and productivity. So we're not going to get into the, you know, which lights are best, but I'll just say that we have, we've tried a lot of different things and, and lights is probably the spectrum, pun intended, of, of where you can spend as little as your budget will allow or as much as your budget will allow. You'll get a big difference in how the plant responds, but it may not really matter. And here's what I mean by that. So we, we started out with just plain shop lights, super duper cheap shop lights, and the plants respond to them. They grow. It was way better than the window. It was way, way better than the window. It was way better than and, the window. And, 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 they, and, and they grow acceptably. So, yeah. so no, no real issues there, but we've also moved up to some nicer LED lights. And when we do a side-by-side, -side, the LED lights produces taller plants in the same time period. If we move up to the, even the more expensive plants, like a grow light, like like some of the more professional grow lights, you'll get even faster growth with less energy consumption. But that comes at a cost. And so, if your goal is simply just to, to get something that's going to live and be acceptable to move out to a greenhouse or yeah, move so out to if, your garden, if you're just, a shop light is fine. If you're just starting vegetable starts and you've just got a couple weeks indoors, you know where you're doing the shop lights are going to probably do you. It's not going to help 
plants bloom. Yeah. You can't. None of the cheaper ones will allow you to get anything like, that's going to bloom. So if you want to bring in your peppers at the end of the year and say, hey, I've heard they're a perennial, we can uh, we can overgrow those. You can. you got to have much better lights. Yeah, with you it, more with, full with, spectrum with the, light. The full spectrum so if I'm going to buy on. shop lights and I went to Menards or somewhere where they buy them and they have this huge aisle of of lights of that shape, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what am I looking for? So for seed starting, I would look for the 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 highest number for color. So that's measured in Kelvin. Ideally, you'd get something that's 6,400 or so or 6,000. Basically, higher the better. Uh, we've got some that are that are above the you know, like 6,400, and those produce really nice, beefy, healthy looking plants. We've got some that are 6,000, which are pretty good. And we got some at 5,000. And those are the ones that they're a little uh, marginal. They're, they're, they're good <laughs> for enough. Us. They're good um, enough. But, but uh, I try and space those out. So we'll try and. Um, yeah. So most not of our, most of together. our shelves will have a mixture of all three just because once we bought them, we want to keep using them. Um, we are going to try a bunch of different lights here this year as we're expanding and adding another couple shelves. But uh, in general, as long as you've got some kind of good light, it'll be much better than the window. So if I was going to ask the dumb question, I could just put my light up here and put my plants down on the floor? Um, depending on the light. So <laughs> if, if you're going to use the thousand dollar lights where if you've never been in a big greenhouse and they've got the big bright lights that are hung from the ceiling, yeah, that works. When you're down here at the, the, the cheapo version, the shop lights, which again work just fine, um, depending it, on... Your most, light diminishes the further it, you're it, from yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> your it's signif effectiveness. Significantly. Yeah. And so, really fast. Uh, for everything that we grow in our garden, it would con I would consider it a, a high light plant. So if you're bringing in tropicals or some other lower light stuff... Yeah, your house plants aren't going to need th super That's going to be a light. different situation. But for the tomatoes and peppers and cucumbers and stuff like that that we start inside, um, consider it a high light plant. And you, you know, two, three, four... One. Yeah. <laughs> really, you just, just it, a couple inches a, above. A couple inches above, but not touching the top of your plant. And you yeah. want it directly over. And I can tell you, like, we have a light out down here at the very bottom. And so I only have two lights, and there's a space in between. And your plants are going to be like, Wee! they're trying yeah, they're, to get they're, to that light. You want it directly they above. They'll grow towards the light. So and, and we not... can tell. We can tell a big difference. And, 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 and in our, our setup, where we're using the 20 inch wide trays. Uh, we use three fixtures for the cheaper shop lights, three fixtures, each one holds two. So across the 20, 24 inch um, width, we've got six bulbs. Now, when we go to the, the little more expensive ones that are more intended, they're, they're more intense light, we can raise that height up to maybe seven, eight inches and, and get away with less bulbs. With two bulbs. But, um, but it costs more. But it costs quite a bit more. Yeah. So what is the problem we're trying to solve with adequate light? So without adequate light, the plants are seeking light. And so the most common thing we'll see, particularly for tomatoes, is they'll do the etiolation thing. They'll, they'll, they'll grow really fast trying to get to yeah, the light. Yeah, they're like, there must be light and, somewhere. And, and so you get the long, skinny, <laughs> floppy. Um, it'll have small floppy. leaves. It'll be pale. It'll look yeah. stretched out. Um, just just sad. Every year on the garden blog, somebody's going to have planted seeds without adequate light. And they're like, how do I rescue these? Yeah. Fortunately um, with tomatoes, you can usually just <laughs> plant it up into, a, you know, an extra three, four inches and, and kind of cover up that mistake. But uh, it's easier to just not have the, mis the yeah, issue to begin with. It's easier. If you're going to grow seeds in any meaningful way, get, it, get grow lights and mean it. Yeah. Um, okay. So principle number seven is control your temperature. So we are in our basement. Our basement is roughly 70 degrees year round. Unless but, I open the windows. Yep. Unless, yeah, that's a whole nother story. <laughs> unless the windows are left open when it's 12 degrees below zero. <laughs> but uh, isn't, from a cold place. <laughs> isn't, uh, isn't uh, seven degrees, 70 degrees good enough? 70 degrees is a good average spot. And it will do some things. It will not do your really warmer things really well. So when you plant seeds, you're kind of in a race. You want them to germinate before something bad happens to them. The closer you are to the ideal temperature and setup that a seed wants to germinate, the better results you'll have. So tomatoes, for example, I think their range is like 7 to 10 days. 
that they say um, is average for tomatoes to emerge. Mm -hmm. I get tomatoes up at four and five days because I've got ideal circumstances. The longer it takes, the more bad things can happen. Mm -hmm. So yeah. you have to find the sweet spot. So for tomatoes, for peppers, for some of these warmer things, they want to germinate at 80 degrees mm -hmm. sometimes 85 degrees peppers sometimes up to 90 degrees we can you can push that that heat level up just a little bit and get them germinating at much faster which in the case of our hot peppers on some of our That's slow growers is a game changer because if you're waiting a month for seeds to come up that's a long time to commit to getting the light just right and the water just right and the air circulation just right and let's be honest, when you're waiting a month, you start picking through, you're like, is it in there? I know, you're like, what happened to, to it? Did I this one? What's, yeah. what's going yeah. on here? And so, and so we use heat mats. Heat mats are going to, at least the kind of standard ones, are going to raise your temperature about 10 to 20 degrees above your ambient temperature. Um, and for your warm season crops, that is fantastic. It will kill other things. So <laughs> yeah. So we, we we've we've in our earlier years made the mistake of well let's let's try to grow peppers and kale on the same same one and the peppers were happy and the kale was dead. Yeah. So, so it. <laughs> kale is trying to escape. It does the same thing. It's like it must be cooler somewhere else and it's stretch stretch die. Yeah. But um, all your cold season crops that you love that you should you should plant seeds for you know lettuce and cabbage and broccoli they all want to germinate around 70 degrees and then they want to come off that heat and drop down to in some cases like 60 degrees because remember they're a cold season crop and and they're okay with cooler weather they need a little cooler weather don't don't yeah, stuff them yeah, in. don't don't feel bad so a general a general rule would be most seeds are going to germinate at about 10 degrees higher than they want to grow at so get them onto a heat mat, get them germinated, take them off the heat mat and drop them back down because um, they, they don't want that extra heat for that long time. Yep. Okay. So, so that was seven, control the temperature. Uh, number eight principle is feed your plants. Now. Yeah. So there, again, a lot of theories are out there. And so I hear a lot of time people say, well, seeds have everything in them that they need to grow. And this is true. And I think that's true to a point. For about two weeks. Yeah. <laughs> for about two weeks because they're 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 packaged with enough food to get them to the next step. Um, beyond that, if I put you in a cubicle at a workplace and said, "Here's some water," how long <laughs> how long would you last without a snack? Oh, if I take a good lunch to begin, if I start out okay, I can I can, can, I can get a little you ways. You can get a but, little ways. Uh, I probably uh, I look down at my my. My extra Your reserves. Food, my, my reserves, and probably I could last two or three weeks without any food. But I can tell you that I would not be very happy for would you, anything uh, beyond about the first that's little right. day or two. And, <laughs> and, and seeds to really grow really effectively want to be fed. But again, we, we want to do this lightly at first in a diluted format and, and as needed because you don't really need a lot. So we do kind of a constant feed. It's almost like a hydroponic thing where you're doing a really low dose pretty consistently and that has worked really well for us. Um, a general rule would be if you were going to look at like a miracle Grow or some other liquid or soluble fertilizer, quarter what it would normally take and, and do that. Yeah. So, but only as needed. And one of the nice things is, is plants um, you know, we don't have specific recommendations saying you must use this particular type of food. The principle is you got to feed your plants regardless. Yeah. Kind of like in, in, in our world today, there's a lot of argument over the different types of diets. The reality is, is they need the macronutrients. They need the micronutrients. And how, 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 how you, you get, get them. At them. And some ways are stinkier than others. We did one year <laughs> and we're like, we're going to do an organic seed starting thing. And we pulled it all in and we're in our house. Um, yeah, we live here. Yeah. We live here, and <laughs> most of the mix was manure. It did not last. We're bringing manure into our house. <laughs> no, was not it was. A it's great fine idea. in the garden, but it, it was. It was great. And so, if you want to do fish oil, that's that's fantastic. We've opted for something or fish emulsion. I've opted for something a little less stinky while we're indoors. Yeah. 
while we're indoors. So the bottom line is they need to be fed, just like if you put me in my cubicle at work, I need to be fed. And, and sort of like your lights, you can really optimize that. Um, if you picture your plant as a potential <laughs> pro athlete, right? Mm -hmm. If you, you, can, you can micro analyze that, and if you were in a big production greenhouse, you would know exactly how much boron, exactly how much copper, exactly how much nitrogen for optimal growth for each specific thing. We're not quite yeah, that so specific. We're not there. I, in, in my professional life, I'm very familiar with the leaf tissue sampling that occurs, for example, in soybeans for those who are trying to break the world record. Um, they're doing, they're pulling tissue samples every single week and they're feeding their plants based, based on, on what, what, it, it needs. what it needs yeah. that week. You don't have to go that far. But if you're you know, interested in, in you know, how much can you really do, there, there's a lot of science that backs that. But in every single case, it's you got to feed the plants what they need. They, and so a, a fertilizer that has some micronutrients and all the macronutrients on a diluted level on a fairly frequent a basis, fairly regular basis, after they're about two weeks old, after they've got true leaves. So they come up with their, the seeds pop up, they have their cotyledon leaves, then they don't even look like the plant you're going to have. The true leaves look like the plant you're going to have start fertilizing then. Yeah. Okay. Principle number nine, transplant them up. So why? That seems like extra work. Why don't we just plant everything in pots like this big and call it good? I mean, that'd be easier. Right. Back to over overcrowding. <laughs> we just talked about how lights are expensive and you want to have your most bang for your buck. And so if I plant <laughs> one or two tomato seeds in my, in my little cup, I'm not using, that's way more soil than I need. It's going to be really hard to keep that soil at the optimal moisture level for long enough to get it germinated to be worthy of this pot, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? So I'm wasting space. Yeah. Do you have, do you have one of the little 72 cell or other oh, yeah. packs next to you? Yep. Just to get an idea. So you'd see these at any home and garden yeah. shop. So basically that one cup takes the spot of four here. Yeah. And this is a 72 cell and we've got some are that are like about two, 288. 288. So you'd be having like 10 ish in the same space. So yeah. So, and if you, again, if you're only growing five things and that doesn't matter to you, great. Start with the bigger pot. But if you're trying to market garden or if you're trying to maximize production or get a lot off of it, um, start small. Start small because start them small grow lights are expensive. <laughs> grow lights are expensive, and the seeds don't need that much space. For I mean, it's just harder to keep it, everything under control. Yeah. And there are some benefits for bumping those plants up and potting them up into bigger containers. So when we do our tomatoes, they they're small, they're little, and they grow. And maybe they've stretched on you because you didn't have enough light. We're going to plant them down deep. They're going to grow more root system, and they'll end up being a stronger plant. Overall, that being said, not everything wants to bump up. So um, some things like cucumbers or your melons, they really don't want their roots messed with, really will mess them up. So we plant them in a bigger pot. Yeah, but, and, and stuff like onions, we don't bump up. We start those and we take them out. And because and they don't actually mind being close to each other, they're easy to tease apart. Yeah. So what the, what are some of the problems that we avoid when we bump stuff up into bigger pots well when you when you're bumping it up so if you've started with the seed mix because we learned back in principle <laughs> two or whatever that you needed the right soil blend most of those seed starting mixes don't come with any nutrition in them it's going to be like peat moss or coir mixed with perlite some of them have a little mycorrhiza in it some of them have a little bit of fertilizer but not much they're meant for that really short window of seed starting so now that they're a little bit bigger and they can handle a little bit more in life, you can use a regular potting mix with maybe a little more nutrition or a, a slow release fertilizer or something mm -hmm. and, and pot them up and you can get them a more nutrient rich environment. Um, as they grow in those small cell packs, you'll see a lot. If you've, if you've done everything right and they grow and they grow fantastic, they'll start to get crowded and those roots will get really tight in there and it's hard to keep them watered and it's hard to get them the nutrition they need, you'll end up with it looking too dense. Mm -hmm. And that's a, a, a recipe for that disease thing that we've had before. And you end up with um, problems. So you give them more space, better circulation. Yeah. Now, doesn't 
doesn't bumping them up cause transplant shock? I and mean, we don't want to stress well, our plants, but you can, you, you can <laughs> we can we have done that before too, where you're like, yay, um, and you planted your beautiful plant in this other thing, and it went bleh. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so one of the things that we we learned early on is when you do transplant, back to that pre moisten your mm -hmm. soil. I remember one year where we, we transplanted everything up and then we watered it, tried to get it all. And it's, those poor pathetic things took like two weeks to recover. Whereas we learned that if you moisten the soil, we warm the soil so that it's moving into a very similar environment yeah. that we're pulling it out of, we had no issues. And we were shocked that it, there wasn't a two week delay yeah, well, for recovery. It reminds me, have you ever transferred a fish from a like a pet shop to a tank? Oh, yeah. And you don't throw the fish into cold water that it's not accustomed you kind of mm. equalize the environment so that it's okay if you have and you don't want to put a totally dry seedling into moist soil either because again back to peat moss being hydrophilic if it dries out all the way and you plant that dry plug even into moist soil or or switch it yeah or, and they it will yeah. not equalize it will not re-moisten so keep them moist together don't throw it out in the hot sunshine you you've heard that you're your plant needs to harden up and, and be strong to live in the outdoors. And so you take your little hot house, <laughs> greenhouse grown things, and maybe you've had a fan, maybe you don't, but you've decided that your lunch break is the best time to take it outside. And so you go set it on the back porch in the full sun in all the wind, <laughs> freshly transplanted. <laughs> First time seeing real sun. First time seeing real sun, <laughs> real wind. And then you're like, oh, I've killed all my, my hard work. So maybe step one would be to put it out in a shady place or on a cloudy day we put all of our stuff in a greenhouse mm -hmm. and even even with the greenhouse sometimes we end up with a temperature shock yeah and what does a temperature shock look like well it just depends on the plant but a lot of times when we do that we will try to take them out on a, a cloudy day yep um or we'll even take them out in the evening so at least I have overnight to get used to it and yep. when the sun comes back up. It's a little less windy usually it, overnight. Yeah, so so just be careful with that. Yeah. Try to make sure that they, they're, they have a nicer transition for the environment. Yeah, and, and have a plan for that. We're going to talk about that with our timing principle coming up, but um, once you've bumped them up into bigger pots, I mean, that expansion is amazing. So if you take, here, you hold this. This is 72 plants, and I'm going to pot it up. And I did really good this year, and so all but two of them lived. Oh, and so man. now we're going to pot them up into little pots like this. So this is gonna, the next it's size up. Take seven of these. Yeah, and so now where am I going to put it? Yeah, um, probably not back under the grow lights. <laughs> probably not back under all, the grow lights. All we have is a 10-inch right? wide tray space. <laughs> so make a plan. So. Kind of like raising kids. You kind of yeah. need to try to get an idea of what's coming up. Yeah. <laughs> and as surprised. soon as you've got them taken care of, they outgrow their pants. And you have to get them a new pair. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. So let's wrap up here uh, with principle number 10, timing your planting. And I'm thinking, man, the last week of, July, of January this year was like was, 50 was degrees. Like 50 <laughs> degrees and warm enough. Why don't we go plant? I just I read earlier this morning that, Facebook post, somebody being really upset that their garden center wasn't open because they were, it was warm enough and they were ready to go out. It is not. It is not. So timing is important. <laughs> timing. <laughs> and there, and um, there are a lot of helpful tools to help you um, figure this out and get through the emotion of it all. I am the emotional end of this relationship, and I'm the one who's going to be like, are we ready now? And um, you can see that I didn't wait. For a lot of things. So, <laughs> most of them are pretty good. And, and, and we're targeting a little bit big, bigger plants because and we're, I have we're green, selling them. And I have greenhouses to send them to. Yeah. And, and so, but timing is important. So, what uh, what things can you plant when? And so, I'm, I'm assuming you don't want to plant your pumpkins inside in January no, because by May, be when it's thing. warm enough, they're going to be like eight foot long. Yeah. Well, if you can get them that far, mostly they're going to die. Yeah. <laughs> so timing is important because large, lanky seedlings that have suffered under the light. So it's going to, what you're, if you start it too early, the problem is going to be, maybe you transplanted it up, but even transplanted it up, 
it's now gotten too big for this pot and we're going to back to root bound it's going to stretch a little bit trying to find light because you're too crowded together and um, they don't transplant well those, those seedlings so a, a more sturdy you want to catch it like tomatoes have like a, a fast growth period if you can catch it in that fast growth period and plant them just right then they just keep going yeah. if you've potted it up early and it's sat there it's decided that maybe maybe we're not going right and it will take it a while to to keep going yeah so we are in middle of iowa and the first week of february what uh what could we what should already be planted now versus what's coming up here in a couple of weeks versus March and April. Okay, so you asking me? Okay, <laughs> the things that we would plant early, so things that should be in the ground now if they're not already, is onions, leeks, parsley should be in right now. All these things take a long time to mature. Um, super, celery. Yeah, super hot uh, peppers. Super hot and, peppers. And, and maybe, Some of them. Maybe I shouldn't say super hot peppers. I'll, I'll say peppers that Slow have, growing have peppers. a very long uh, period between um, transplanting and maturity. Yeah. So most of our peppers are not in right now. You get the super, I'll call it the super hots because usually the, the ones they're that slower. take a long time are, are the super hots and they're slower. So uh, we do have some of those in. Some of those have been planted. I've talked with others who planted back in December already. So. Yeah, and again, if you can you can mess with that planting time depending on what your resources are. I'm gonna start just a little bit earlier because, and you might start earlier. If I was market gardening and I was like, I want to have the first tomato to market because that's that's premium, right? That's premium. I might aim to, to push that envelope, but I'm gonna have to have a plan for where to put that and how to keep them growing and and all those things and some people want to grow their peppers way ahead um so yeah. you you can do it you just have to have a plan yeah just just try to do your best to time it and part of that timing is getting your lights right because again if you have the really expensive lights that's going to shorten your your time that you can leave them under lights then that's more time out in the greenhouse that's more propane you got to use to you know, yeah. whatever so, to, to so keep them for heated. us so for us this is this is what we do because we have them growing inside and that's not expensive to heat because we were heating the house for us anyway. Yeah. Um, but we don't want to waste propane on a greenhouse because that's really expensive. So we are targeting for our cool season crops, things like strawberries, we'll get a bare root berry order. We could put some of the, the cooler season things like um, brassicas mm -hmm. or whatever. They'd be okay yeah. in a slightly heated greenhouse, right? Yeah. Where I'm keeping it above freezing. Mm -hmm. Barely. But it's not, and during the day it's fine, but it's not super warm. Tomatoes are going to complain about that. Oh, yeah. And so we target not to get them out there until April. And so we're... We, yeah, first week or so of April is when most and so, of those go out. So that what that looks like here, and you asked for my list, so I'm going to look <laughs> at it, is in February I'm going to be planting, I'm going to be planting um, peas and spinach. I could plant some lettuce. Um, in the next week or so, all of those things can be planted early. They don't mind the cool weather. I can plant them outside in March sometime, right? I'm just gonna keep them in for a few weeks. Um, the second half of February is where I'm gonna start to plant my peppers and, um, well, even, I shouldn't, but I should wait till <laughs> March. I catch me on this, the beginning of March, end of February, eh, depends on my thing. Yeah. But kale, kohlrabi, le lettuce, brassicas can all go in that in February. Mm -hmm. In March, beginning of March, or February if I can squeeze it, <laughs> we're going to put in like peppers and eggplants and chard. I might do cauliflower and broccoli because I can set that out a little early um, and do that. And mid-March is when I'm starting my, my basil, my tomatoes, and my mm -hmm. peppers. We have a lot that gets planted that that I'll say the 10th through the 20th of March is, is a really good is time. A real peak planting season for all the warm season stuff for us. And that is targeting a uh, May 1st ish. About, yeah, about a May, May you know, Things will be a little small for us on May 1st, Too May outside. 7th. They'll be, they'll be perfect May 14th or so, whatever Mother's Day. We typically target everything. We, we base everything on Mother's Day, which I know is not the best situation because it's a moving date. But uh, a lot of people will use Mother's Day as their trigger to, to go buy plants. And so that's, yeah. that's one of our, our uh, 
flags that we aim for. So, and then you notice we didn't mention pumpkins yet. They're not yet. Not yet. <laughs> They're not okay. yet. When, when, so, when should we do pumpkins? So, and stuff like it, that? with the targeting a May first, I can plan it outside date. We're starting in April, early April. So we're only four weeks out. We're going to do if you were going to do corn or melons or cucumbers or zinnia or sunflowers, all those things that are going to just out of the ground really fast. And then mid April, mid April is when I'm starting my squash and my pumpkins. You have to wait yeah. all the way. So that's that's what we do here now. Are we going to do a follow-up video, maybe post a short on how to look up those dates for everybody's individual zip code? Yeah, learning how to find those zip code or the using your zip code, we can do that or we'll post the link in yeah, the description. We'll, we'll, we'll post a little link for that. because And you can find your own because knowing, knowing that time and then being able to work around what are my resources, what am I trying to accomplish, you know, how much well, am I willing to invest in this potting it up or spending in propane? Timing drives so much yeah. stuff. I think knowing how to do that, and again, we'll, we'll, we'll follow up with a short video on that. I think that's just critical because if we're a week early, that's a, a week of propane that we have to run. And it's spendy. And and for us, if we run, and we're just little backyard operations, but no. we'll spend, uh, if all on, on cold nights, we'll spend $100 a night heating all the, the greenhouses. And so... $700 because we missed stuff by a week. That kind of hurts really bad because we're small. <laughs> yeah, so we, we only grow, we'll grow probably 10,000 plants mm -hmm. this spring. Um, so, yeah, so timing is critical. And then again, we'll post the link for that, that video. All right, I hope this helps. But, um, let us know if you have any questions or what your experience has been. Yep, yeah, and if you liked it, go ahead and like, share, subscribe, all those things. It really does help. I used to laugh hearing everybody else say that. But now that we're actually making a couple of videos, we do realize it does help. So we appreciate you and hope you have a good one. Talk to you later. Yep, yeah, bye-bye.